Welcome to Alda University's Introduction to Research Data Management. This training session provides an overview of the data lifecycle and gives some pointers on good data management practices, as well as provides some information on the IDM support available at Alda University. This is very much a introduction, partially because it covers the breadth of disciplines here at Alto. So that includes life sciences, technology, business, arts, and design. Meaning that, of course, that the data that is being worked on varies greatly as well, as do the instruments, practices, and considerations that are associated to the research. So while this particular session doesn't go into discipline-specific questions, such as scientific computing, um, or the details of handling personal data, we do have a variety of sessions that cover those as well in the Alta RDM uh, webinar series. So though we cover the very basics here, I hope that the issues and questions that are raised in the session are ones that you can all consider from the point of view of your own discipline and, the own, and your own data that you're working with. And of course, because, because you are the experts on the data yeah, that you are working on. So first, a bit of, of what we'll cover. Uh, we'll talk about what is research data and RDM, who is who are we doing this RDM for? And then we go into more of the specifics by going through the RDM lifecycle. And lastly, we look briefly at what services Alta provides for research data management. And first off, to start with the very basics, what is the research data? Research data is any information that has been given, uh, collected, observed, generated, or created to validate your research findings. So this could be um, data that emerges from your own research, or it also includes pre-existing data that you use um, in your project that might have been created by someone else. And in practice, if you think about what this looks like, it could be code, medical draw data, drawings, statistical models, uh, production processes, um, simulations and so forth. So it cover it, it comes in all shapes and sizes. And then research data management refers to the organization, storage, sharing, and preservation of this research data. And as we spoke before, data management practices depend greatly on how the data is generated, um, what are the methods or instruments used to create it or, or software, but in essence, I would think that RDM is something that you are most likely already already doing uh, when you're doing your research. And this session gives some pointers on how to be smart and mindful about managing this. And as there is an increasing push towards uh, open science and open data, this means more opening and sharing of data. There is more expectations placed upon how we handle our research data. And the next question it might, might be of, of why do it, why do um, RDM in a specific way or care about keeping your practice up to date? So who is this for? Um, primarily, the, the first port of call is that it's for the researcher, it's for yourself. Um, I hope you haven't been in a situation where your computer breaks down and you need to wonder, is your data backed up? Um, a lot of the RDM things that we're talking about is mitigating risks that are risk that um, are related to your research, and doing managing your data in a in a mindful way. It saves you some time and hassle, so it avoids those horrible situations where you lose your work, for example, when your computer breaks down. And it's also essentially taking time in the beginning of a project to decide on how you will handle your data. Um, also, because that saves you some hours at the end of the project when you're scrambling around looking for um, a piece of information or code or, or um, interview or whatever. So, and then there's also um, many questions, especially regarding research ethics uh, and legal issues that are much simpler to solve before you start gathering the data. So these are things that help you, the researcher, and if you're working in a research group, you might be getting questions like, uh, what was the instrument settings for those measurements again? Or do you know where that last version of the code was? Could you show me how you created that render on a vase, for example? 
So RDM, in this context, it helps you and your colleagues find and communicate about the data. So it's useful in cases where you have a new person who joins the research group and they need to be uh, introduced to the data and sort of brought up to speed. Uh, you might have one person who leaves halfway through a project and someone needs to step in and continue their work. So having good data management practices just makes your work easy to understand. It helps avoid some mistakes um, and keeps your data consistent. And it's also in part for your research community. So when you publish an article, you might get an email saying that well, a super interesting article would be possible to share the data behind it or fantastic code. Could I also use it in this um, in my own research? And in opening the data and, and allowing other researchers to um, see it and possibly even use it, it improves transparency and reprodu reproducibility of, of research. So other researchers could run your tests, verify your results. Um, it gives researchers insight into your, your work that journal articles alone could not. And it improves the openness of science. So when your data is organized, named, uh, generally in order, it can be open and shared with others uh, through, for example, a data repository where you can upload your data online and anyone can, can reuse that. And actually, maybe to me even more, even more so, the exciting part is that you have a world of data at your fingertips as a researcher that you can go into those repositories and use someone else's data. So you might be reusing a data set for your own purposes, looking at it from another angle, or make original findings by analyzing data in a, in a new way, or, or applying it elsewhere. And then increasingly, we also have uh, another group, which would be the funders and publishers. So uh, most funders foster open data and good man uh, data management practices. And because there is a general push, both in Finland, EU and globally on those levels towards open data, one way of doing this is that funders require you to open your data. So how will you make your data open if, if we fund this project might be a question. Um, and a part of this is also that many uh, funders require a data management plan in which you map out how you'll be using your data and make sure that you're doing it in, in a smart way. And most funders require that you should open your data as much as possible. Uh, in some cases, of course, you can't because it might be confidential or um, sensitive personal data. In those cases, if you can't open your data, it's recommended that you open at least the metadata. So the data information describing your, your research data, if not the data sets themselves. And also some journals uh, request opening your data. Um, and this is a part of opening that discussion about research methodology and the process of arriving to your conclusions. So kind of opening up what's behind your article. And if you're working with human participants in your research, a journal might uh, require you to have done an ethics pre-review. And as the name states, it's something that you should do before you start collecting uh, your data. So as you see here, there is a, a wealth, a cacophony of overlapping needs regarding your research data. And when in practice, it's, you know, it's, it's the files on your computer, it may be difficult at times to figure out uh, which things are relevant for you and your data in particular. So next, when we look at the uh, data lifecycle in more detail, keep in mind these various uh, interested parties and how they might, might be or might not be relevant for your work. And here is the kind of roughly chopped, the life cycle of data. And it is here divided into six steps which are somewhat chronological. So before you start gathering your data, uh, during the project and at the end of the project. Most generally, this is about being mindful and aware of the life cycle of the data in different, different stages, um, which what, what these steps look like you, those were vary based on what you're working with, what your data is about, uh, the analyzing methods might be used, instruments and software and so forth. So. We'll start looking at these in, in more detail. And we will start with the most important one, which is the planning. 
So at the very beginning of, of the process, the most important step, which is to plan. And when you're beginning your research work, you might have an idea and maybe some expectations of what kind of material you'll be gathering. You might be wondering about uh, where to save your files. Is Dropbox okay for sharing files or should you use some other um, service? Um, what do you need to know if you're doing interviews? And you may, might be wondering about how to best organize your lab experiments. And to help with all of those, answer all those questions is why we have the data management plan. In essence, it's a document that describes what kind of data you will generate and how you will handle and manage it. And as I mentioned earlier, it's often something that funders require. And even if you don't have an external funder that, that uh, is requiring you to write this, I would really recommend that you write a DMP for your project in any case. And it should be written before you start gathering your data, um, possibly alongside your research plan. Um, and one thing to note is that it's a living document and it's reviewed, uh, updated as you go along. And as we know, research projects early go according to the your best laid plans or your first thoughts of, of how things will go. And a DMP is not set in stone and it's OK to update it as you go along. But the point of it is to help clarify some points straight from the start. Those might include ownership. Um, and it's really useful to talk through these, these things through uh, in your research group, for example, at the beginning to avoid any sort of sinkholes along the way. It also asks you to uh, pay special attention if you're working to the ethical and legal issues that might um, affect your work. So if you're working with personal data, are you working with data that's coming from external sources, for example, companies? Um, do you think your work might lead to inventions or patents? Just planning over those things. Um, and also the reason why you're doing it before you start gathering the, the data itself, it's a lot easier to say if you're doing interviews and you want to realize that actually you want to share those interview answers with an external a different another university it's easier to ask the permission from the interviewees from the get-go rather than go around and get the same um, consent again so writing a dmp helps you be systematic about managing your data it saves you some time um, it gives you an opportunity to sit down and really think through the requirements that you have uh, for your data and prepare for those and also, if you have a funder that requires a DMP, I recommend that you check their guidelines in advance and make sure that you have um, an up most up-to-date version of their template. And a template could look much like this. So these are a few questions that a DMP should or could answer. In practice, a data management plan is often simply a set of questions on a Word document that you answer in your own words. So often it's organized in this kind of a way um, where, you, where you first describe what your data is about, what is the subject, um, range, scope, how are you going to gather this data, and then go into a bit of detail about how you're going to describe it, um, organize it, are there any ethical and legal aspects that you should consider, and how will you store it? And, and are you going to open the data, which was the one that your funders are likely to be interested in? And also here, if you're not going to open your data, uh, what are the reasons behind that? And I would stress that you don't need to have all the answers uh, right at the start. It's actually quite natural that for some questions, you just haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> And you might need a bit of time to look into those more and find out it and review it in time. And that is entirely fine. And that's partially the point of a DMP. It shows you the stuff that you need to consider and plan for a bit more. And as said, it's a living document and you update it as you go along. Uh, you'll also all get the slides and there is a link to uh, a generic finished DMP template in English, though, that you can download if and just give it give it a stab if you want to try it out. But for those of you who might uh, find an empty Word document a bit difficult to get started with, you might want to try using uh, a DMP tool. There are several. Most of these allow you to test them out for free. 
One of them is the Data Stewardship Wizard, which is essentially a bank of questions regarding how you are going to manage your data. And they're very short, uh, sort of yes, no, multiple answer kind of ones that you can click through and then you can export your answers into a template, say the Horizon Europe, they're usually based by Funder. And the tool generates these full sentence answers from your choices. The questions are very thorough um, and the wizard also provides some links to further information. The benefit of this is that if you're a bit unsure where to start, uh, what needs to be included, what information is relevant, um, this sort of covers all the bases. That said, there are a lot of questions if you want to go through those, uh, if you go through the most thorough version of the questionnaire. In a similar way, there's the DMP Online and Argos that ask you questions about your research and then to sort of cover all the bases of, of your data management. And uh, Dea Betuli is, um, is a Finnish tool of these where you also find examples of DMPs uh, templates that funders are using, for example, the Finnish Academy. And it's, it also has um, DMPs made by other researchers that you can go in and just have a read through. So you see examples of, of what a DMP looks like. And I really recommend doing that. It takes away a bit of uh, uh, mystique around them when you get to read, read through a few and see that they're not that um, difficult after all. And for those of you at Aldo, we offer DMP guidelines. So we have templates. Um, guidelines and plenty of guidance online and we also offer a review service so if you do need to submit a DMP for a funder you can send it to researchdata at alda.fi for a review uh, we'll give notes on it and help you refine it so that it is ready for your funder so after that planning and actually as a part of it uh, before you start gathering your your research data is considering the ethics and legal issues. So this is when you've got an idea of the data that you'll be working with, and it's time to consider what the what, what ethical, ethical and legal issues apply to your data. So will you be handling personal data? Are you collecting this? Does it need to be anonymized? How will you do it? At what stage? Um, if you're a, assigning interviewees a number, is there a document that has the name and the associated number somewhere? Um, in the cases of, of medical research, it might be important that the data gathered is pseudonymous, but there might be findings which require you to contact the person. Um, and as a part of, of the work that you need to do before starting, collecting the data is recognizing what issues apply to, to your work. And in a small nutshell, these are the special data types that we recommend that you look out for. Um, and be especially mindful if you're working with. One of these is, of course, personal data. And that includes information that identifies a person directly or indirectly. Uh, it might be their name, an ID number, location data, IP address, uh, one or more factors specific to their physical, psychological, genetic, cultural, and social identity of a natural person. Um, keep in mind that uh, a single factor might not be used to identify an individual, but if you have several of these, it doesn't take very many uh, when they're put together that you might be able to triangulate who, who that person is. And then we have personal sensitive data, which would be personal data, which regards um, racial or ethnic origin, political opinions, uh, religious or philosophical uh, beliefs, trade union membership, genetic uh, biometric data, data concerning health, or data concerning a person's sex life or sexual orientation. And then those are with the, the personal data kind of group. And then in addition to those, we have also uh, confidential data. So this might be if you're working with a company where the data is obtained from that company and it might co uh, cover commercial interests or trade secrets. So when working with these types of data, uh, take into consideration to how you're going to protect the rights of the research participants and respect the ownership of that data. So when you're working with these data types, um, before collecting, things to kind of keep in mind, plan the full life cycle from the gathering up until how you're going to dispose of the data. If you're collecting sensitive personal data, get an ethical pre-review. 
Um, this just means that uh, an ethics board will give some advice and pointers and flag up possible um, things that you need to be aware of when you're working with, with sensitive data. Uh, be very clear about the procedures that you should uh, do to inform your research subjects about their rights. And um, as with the, again, th these are important to do before you start collecting your work, because, for example, the pre-review, the ethical pre-review is something that you need to do before you start gathering your data. You can't do it afterwards. Uh, whilst you're collecting, storing, sharing your data, um, use secure online data collection methods, um, use storing and sharing services that suit personal data and enable that um, secure sharing. Define who has access to the data. Um, if you're working with other institutions, are you allowed to share the data with them? Do you have consent from the participants? These kind of questions. And if you're planning on publishing the data, check that you're allowed to do that. Um, there's uh, for preparing your data for publishing. For example, if you have personal data, you might need to anonymize it or pseudonymize it. So pseudonymization, which mean that um, the direct identifiers may, may, may be removed, but it is still possible to track back some of the data to an individual and might be possible to identify an individual. Anonymization means that there is no way to trace the data back to the individual. And that is really difficult to do. So um, be, be careful when you promise that something will be anonymizing or anonymized. It's not just removing um, the interviewees' names. It is uh, a bigger process than that. Also, uh, when you're publishing these, these types of data, define access rights to the repository so that they suit um, suit your data. And as mentioned earlier, if you can't publish the data, you might publish a description of your data, and that is suffice. So there is a lot to consider there. And in honesty, um, when you're working with, say, personal or sensitive data, and, and you're doing the ethics reviews and all that, there um, you need to factor in that it's a lot of paperwork, it does take time, um, and it can be a bit daunting. And it is often where researchers need additional support from research services. And that's fine because we have plenty of support for this. Um, there's a host of links there regarding uh, for ALTA people. And actually, these are some of these are visible also to, to non-ALTA participants. So guidance on handling personal data, informing your research participants, and also a general guide to personal data and ethics. And we've recently done a handling personal data in a nutshell guide, which offers a step-by-step -step guide to what paperwork you need. So a privacy notice, uh, consent to participate, all that stuff um, is in, in that, that guide. And there is also contact de uh, details for the lawyers and other experts here at the Alder Research Innovation Services who can help you out. And the Finnish Social Science Data Archive is a great source of information especially about anonymizing or minimizing the collection of personal information. So I really recommend um, having looked through their website. It's both in Finnish and in English. And then there's a list of, of general sort of guides and, and uh, legal and ethical rules to abide by. The big one, of course, being the GDPR, uh, Data Protection Regulation, the EU. And then there's the um, ALA Code of Conduct for Research Integrity and the Finnish one, which is closely related, the DENK one, so the Responsible Conduct uh, for Research. So we're sort of working, working by these, but uh, there's plenty of advice and guidance available. And now we're getting finally to the point that you've planned your project, you've taken into account the uh, legal and ethical issues, and you're ready to start uh, gathering your data. Your data itself, it might be measurement data, images, audio files, algorithms, 3D models, text files, calculations, whatever. And once those files start piling up, you get it, they start getting names like Monday test or spreadsheet updated, um, the need to organize that data arises. So why do we need to pay attention to this? is questions to think about when you are naming your files and putting them into folders is that will you understand your data in five years time will your group leader 
understand your data, not even in five years, but now. So if someone else was given your data files, would they have a clue what you were doing? If there was a case that someone else needed to come in and to continue your project in the future based on your data, uh, would they know what you were doing or be able to replicate what you were doing, for example? So in some fields, for example, peer reviewers might request to see unopened data. So it makes sense to keep this, uh, keep it organized from the start. So it is about ensuring that you and others can find, use, and properly cite your data by naming and organizing it in wisely and describing it well. So good documentation decreases the risk of a false interpretation of the data. And well-organized, named, and structured uh, files also help when you're preparing the data for analysis, um, and which is, might be a significant and sometimes time-consuming step of that research. Of course, these documenting practices are specific to the field and data. So I'm going to give you some examples of how this can be done, and you can see which, or think about which ones apply for you and your data. Obviously, the uh, simple ways of doing this, which I bet you're doing already, is to have a folder structure. Name those folders appropriately, uh, separate ongoing and completed work, and also schedule a time when you clean out the unnecessary files from, from folders. And this might be uh, this might be especially important if you're working in a research group, but it's very useful um, if you're doing individual work as well. You might also use the file names themselves to include information. And you could de devise yourself a, a file naming convention to give these meaningful names. So deciding which elements should be um, there to facilitate file finding and agree on those elements. It might be the date, experiment name, methods, project identifier, version, um, subset, so forth. And there you see an example of, of a file, um, an audio file in which the file name already gives a bunch of information to to the reader. You can also document the information inside the data file. So if you're working with spreadsheets, it makes sense that you um, use descriptive headers. Um, or if you're doing audio work, you might add a bit of descriptive information at the beginning of interviews to be able to identify those. And it is recommended to also use supplementary documentation. Most commonly, that would be a README file. There's a link to, I think it's Cornell University example uh, in the file, or the, the slides. And these README files are used to describe the naming and the structures of your folders and files. Um, you could be using code books. There's the ADD initiative, for example, uh, which gives some guidance and sort of how to organize and gather together the essential information about your data in a way that is um, smartly um, organized and easy for a reader to kind of grasp what you're doing. For some of you, you might be working with lab notebooks. Um, an example of that is the Alba E notebook that you have uh, um, a clip there. So there are plenty of places to put this um, put this information. And one of the, the big questions there to ask yourself is, um, are you explaining, is there sufficient metadata? Um, are you explaining where the data is coming from uh, sufficiently? And is it in a way that is, might be re, uh, reusable for other researchers? And a part of this is choosing on a metadata um, standard that you might be working with. So essentially metadata is data about data, uh, usually in text form that describes something about the creation, the content, uh, or the file. So it relates to, it's a digital resource that can come out of two ways. It can be automatically derived or human made. So metadata created by humans is most time consuming to create, but usually most important. So this is where you jot down how you've done uh, your research or, or how did you find your interview participants and so forth. And there's a list of different types of metadata that this could include, descriptive, it might have rights information, um, technical information, so about how that digital file was created, how it's managed with the administrative, or 
how it should be kept in the future, which would be presenta- uh, preservation data or metadata or um, structural. So how it relates to um, different versions or, or so forth. And there's an example uh, on the right. There's a, a drawing and then um, with Dublin Core, a description of metadata about this uh, this particular drawing. So it has a title, creator, subject. Um, and I point out, for example, the uh, language code is SWE rather than, and you have like country codes. So it, it is then both um, metadata that it's if it's in a standardized form, it becomes readable by, of course, humans, but also by machines. And Dublin Core is one of the, the more popular, most popular ones in, in the humanities. So it is worth having a um, doing a bit of research about which metadata standards are used in your field and seeing how those could apply to your research. What information is key for your field to be included with your data files to make them um, understandable and possibly reusable to others. And this metadata can be stored within the file itself or within a database or separate text file. So food for thought. And then the storage and sharing of files is the most important part, but the, the, one of the most more important things as well. So this is essentially you need somewhere that is safe and that has enough space. Things to consider here are, is your data being backed up? So rather than having it um, on a computer or a memory stick that might be lost or broken, is it being backed up into a cloud? Um, who has access to your data? Is it in a safe and secure um, storage um, facility? And if you need to share it, how can you do that in, in a safe way? And these sort of questions of safety and access become even more important when you're working with private or sensitive data. And there is a link to the Alta ID document, which outlines security levels and storage. So you can have a look there if you're thinking you're working, especially with those special data categories like the personal data or um, sensitive data and confidential data. And you can have a look and find um, suitable storage solutions for you. This, I'm afraid, is quite Alta heavy. So we have the options that we have are the network drive. So these are large, fast, secure, and they're also backed up. And uh, it's the play best, essentially it's the best place to save working data in Aldo. They're like folders on your computer, but more secure. And you need an Aldo account to access them and you can access them remotely via VPN. If you have a team or a group that you need uh, a folder for, you can get, get that set up by contacting service desk at alta.fi. And these are suitable for personal confidential data as well. There you see the quotas, purposes, eligibility, and access um, information in, in the table. So those are the ones that are on the network drive that we're using. And then the Aldo cloud services, you get a, a similar sort of uh, breakdown with uh, Microsoft Teams as a collaboration tool for uh, meetings, file sharing, and uh, and that. And then we have the other cloud storage facilities like OneDrive, Google Drive, and Dropbox. Um, easy sharing of non-confidential data. Um, and if it's confidential, it should be encrypted on these ones. And importantly, if you're using, say, Google Drive or, or Dropbox, we recommend using your Aldo account because that way you get more space and more features there. And when you're looking at these tables of, of what is uh, available, it becomes a sort of question of finding which option is, is most suitable for your data. So for example, again, if you're working with interview data containing sensitive information, you might not be able to um, share it via, via some of the, um, the cloud services. So in that case, it might be a, or store it there and then work it work with it there. So in that case, the solution might be to use the Alta network drive. Whilst if you're working with experimental data in a lab, that can be stored and shared by the cloud services. So it's about finding the customized solution for your data. And for this, we have the IT services on hand to help. And there's also a session on um, research data and, and storing it. And then towards the end, uh, once you've finished your research work, 
it is you might be might choose to publish your research data and make it findable to the outside world. And much in the same way as you would um, have a research article, when you publish your research data, it becomes um, sort of an, an, its own research output in a way. So open data, you store it and publish it in a data repository or archive. It is available for anyone to find and reuse. And as the owner of the data, you decide how open you want it to be. So you might want it to be embargoed, so you have time to um, publish your articles first before it becomes um, accessible to everyone else. Or you might want it to be opened by request. And as the owner of the data, you decide, uh, for example, what license you want to use to open the data. This might be a CC license. Um, that I'm sure you're familiar with, but there's a, those are explained uh, by the side. So you might have a by attribution, um, no commercial derivatives or, or share alike or no derivatives works. Um, might be options which might be most, most useful for your particular data set. And otherwise, the open science policy recommends that data should be as open as possible, but as closed as necessary. So again, consider if you're working with um, personal data, if that can or should be even opened. But why publish your research data? Um, Published data is an independent research output, much like a scientific article. So like a scientific article, it gets a DOI number when published. Um, and when you consider the published um, data as a research output, it makes sense to curate it. So it should be clear, to be well-organized, coherent whole that validates your research findings and research results and has everything needed to replicate the study and that is useful for other researchers. So it's not just taking your whole file from your computer and plonking it online, but it's a matter of curating it so that it is um, it backs up your research findings and is useful for others. And the published data can be cited, uh, giving credit to the creators and co uh, the contributions, and it also gives you a citation advantage. And again, as mentioned before, typically funders require open data. Also, some journals demand open data as well. And if you're thinking about where to do this, here are some repositories. I recommend going in um, using these links and to have a snoop about. So there might be, you might want to use a general repository. The, these cover various different types of data research outputs. Zenodo uh, is, is a big one. Um, and there are uh, a few others. And also, but then also we have uh, domain specific repositories, which are planned for that specific data type. So it might be crystallographic data or the Finnish social science data archive. And I will, in case you're wondering which one to, to use, uh, one option would be to have a look at the catalog of repositories, which I think is um, quite cool. So this is the uh, read, data, three, read three data, where you can browse by subject. So here you have a wheel. You might select, say, natural sciences, um, chemistry, and it goes down to different subjects, say, uh, molecular work, and say, organic. And it gives you a list of different kinds of, of repositories for organic molecular chemistry. So as you see, there are a wealth of different types of, of uh, repositories. So I recommend going there and there's a link on the slides. So having a snoop there. So there are a lot of options. And then lastly, last but not least, is the question of archiving your data for long term and reporting it. Um, in most, many cases, it's sufficient to upload your work to a data repository and it can happily live there for, uh, for even 10 years or so. But in some cases, you might want to have a bit of a longer lifespan for it. But once you've post or um, deposited your work into a repository, at Aldo, we recommend that you report your data in Oculus, which is our current research um, infrastructure. So here are the 
uh, guidance on how to do it, essentially you just send a link to us, uh, research data at Alto, and then we add that for you. And the, um, the nice thing about it is that it ensures that your data can be identified, just like your articles, it maximizes the visibility of your data, and then you can also easily link it into your CV. And then if you decide that or think that the you have some data that is very valuable and, and significant, it, and it might need to be archived for a very long period, so this means decades and or, or centuries, um, there are some options, um, our bus and unfair data in Finland as well. So there's a section of guidelines and criteria there. And if you think that you might be working with this type of data set at Alto, you get in touch with us and we'll, we'll help you, um, help you try to get archived there. So it's preserved for a very long time. Right. And as promised, at the very end, I'll give you a bit of further training and help. So that was a lot to cover. So you probably have questions. One way that you might want to have a look at is that we offer a lot of um, training that um, covers in more detail some of these topics. So the data management plans, we have a session for that, handling personal data, the legal aspects of research data, um, doing ethical reviews, anonymizing data, storage of research data, and so forth. So you can go into these. All of these are available and accessible through the um, Alto IDM webinar series. And then for those at Alto, we have the data agents who are researchers who are based at your departments who advise on research data management. Um, they help you figure out the, the practical questions that you might have with your, your data and advise where to publish it. And they also do a, uh, a weekly hour, uh, a data agent hour on Zoom. So you can just log in, ask your questions and get a bit of advice. And similarly, we have the research data at Aldo email address where we have data agents, IT experts, legal counsels and information specialists to help you with your data. Wonderful. Thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you at the other training uh, webinars as well.